on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. You know, getting some perspective is a wonderful thing. And today I'm going to show you the Bitcoin chart from two perspectives, which I think you will find quite enlightening. And then we'll talk a bit about Schnorr signatures, which is an upcoming upgrade to Bitcoin with some pretty positive side effects. So all of that on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. So stay right there. Hi there guys, welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I'm your host, Chris Coney. So the perspective on the Bitcoin price chart. First of all, a shout out to Twitter user Igor Yabima for reminding me of this tweet that I posted out back on the 15th of September. Now, let me click on the image that I posted here. So it was it was hashtag China, so this must have been the ICO ban or China bans Bitcoin again situation. But when we zoom in on this image, we see the Bitcoin price had a run up from about $3,000 here to about, no, actually it was 1826 it had a run up from, 1826 and it had a run up to about $5,000. But then within a couple of weeks, it drops from 5,000 to about 3,000. So that's a 40% correction. Now for the benefit of the podcast listeners, I also drew some arrows on this chart, which pointed to the 40% drop, and then some text saying, one year from now, this, the 40% drop, will look like this. And then I drew another arrow pointing to a previous price correction that is relatively small compared to the, the one that happened when I took the screenshot. Now my intention there was to give myself and everyone else a bit of perspective, right? And lo and behold, it didn't actually take a year for this to happen again. It took three months for what I said in that tweet to pan out. So I said that big price crash will look like a little price crash one year from now. And that has already happened three months on. So this time, if we go over to the current Bitcoin price chart, here it is on Coindigy. This is my live chart price feed from Bitfinex. We see an oddly similar pattern here, but at different price levels. So this time we had a run up from about 5,400 to 20,000. And then the price crashed down about 45% to around 11,000. And then for those of you watching the video version of this, the white circle here, you see that? This is the previous price crash that I just featured in that tweet, which in the tweet looks enormous, but from this perspective, it looks insignificant, which is exactly what I was pointing out in the tweet, that some point in the future, which is now, this is what that 40% price crash would look like from 5,000 to 3,000. And now we see this much bigger swing in volatility. Now, if this pattern were to continue, then one day we would see like a run up to say a million dollar Bitcoin. And then if it were a 45% price correction, we'd see a price correction down to 550,000 from a million. Now, hypothetically, that's true. But realistically, I don't think it will happen that way because by the time we reach a million dollar Bitcoin, we'll have a lot more liquidity, which I say should, <laughs> it should reduce the volatility with more liquidity. That's what I meant to say there. So still possible, you know, that's my expectation that more liquidity by the time we reach a million would um, dampen the volatility, but we'll have to see. In the meantime, though, between now and a million dollar Bitcoin, we may have some interim boom and busts that follow this exact pattern. So we'll, uh, we'll have to look out for those and buy the dip as we always do. Now let's talk about the main topic I want to talk about today. Schnorr signatures, one of the next big upgrades to the Bitcoin Core code. Now, I'm basing this section on an article from a Mr. Sam Wooters, I think his name is. Let's uh, hop over here to his Medium blog, which is where I've got the information from for today's segment. So this guy is a speaker and Bitcoin consultant, and he's, he's written this article 
on his Medium blog called Why Schnorr Signatures Will Help Solve Two of Bitcoin's Biggest Problems Today. Now, as we all probably know, at least by now, there are two distinct camps in the Bitcoin community, and each have opposite ideas about how to increase the capacity of the Bitcoin network so it can process more transactions, right? The Bitcoin Cash community, they're in favor of an approach that requires more computing resources, right? By increasing the block size, which requires more hard drive space, more bandwidth, but is arguably simpler in, te in technological terms, right? And then you have the Bitcoin community that are in favor of a more creative process where we invent new techniques in order to achieve more and more with the existing resources that we have, like one megabyte block sizes and, and so on. So that's like making better use of existing resources. Now, when the Bitcoin Cash community criticized things like SegWit, one of the major objections is that SegWit doesn't actually improve scaling. Well, that's true because SegWit was never meant to be a scaling solution in and of itself. Right? It does increase the capacity of Bitcoin slightly, but that's not SegWit's primary purpose. So it's not really fair to criticize SegWit on that basis, I don't think. Now, activating SegWit was a step of preparation, which I've said before, and SegWit lays the foundation for many other technologies to build on top of it, right? And now that we have SegWit, the road to those new technologies that can be built on top of it, the road is now clear, right? One of those technologies is Schnorr signatures. And uh, as far as I understand it, SegWit is a prerequisite in order to use Schnorr signatures, which is why I'm talking about them in this context. Now, because Schnorr signatures require um, SegWit, that means that the code can't easily be integrated into Bitcoin Cash, not in its current form anyway. Bitcoin Cash would require SegWit in order to start using Schnorr signatures. This is as far as my technical understanding goes. So Schnorr signatures, in a nutshell, as the name suggests, it's a new way of handling how transactions are signed so that the signatures, the digital signatures, use up less storage space within a block, right? And then you can fit more transactions in a block. That makes sense, right? And to put that into perspective, Sam says we're looking at like a 25% reduction in storage and bandwidth if you use Snore signatures. So he says at least 25% reduction in the amount of storage space and bandwidth required for Bitcoin transactions. So that's an example of using the existing resources more efficiently. And the way this is accomplished is basically by having all transactions use just one digital signature, not one digital signature overall, one each, right? And that would be no matter how many addresses are involved in the transaction. So let's get some visuals on this because Sam displays a couple of diagrams here. So here's under the heading number one, and you know, it signatures helps us with scalability. It has this diagram that shows how signatures work in today's Bitcoin transactions. So as two examples, it has the first transaction we have a sender and a receiver, and in the center you have a signature. Someone signs the transaction, the sender signs the transaction, and it's sent to the receiver. That's fine if it's just one input, one address to one address, that's fine. But in a situation where say you have mul multiple addresses sending to the receiver or vice versa, then you have a signature for each and every one of the inputs, technically called the inputs, right? Then, however, if we move on to, so you see here, this is why there is more space required in the in a transaction with only two addresses, the sender and the receiver, one signature, that's fine. But in a situation where you've got these three input addresses, you need a signature for each one of them. And then the receiver can receive it just the same, except now you've got three signatures, three times the space required, and a more expensive transaction. In a world of Schnorr signatures, as we can see from diagram number two, no matter whether you're just sending from one address to another, or whether you're sending from these three addresses, like it shows here, to another address, those three could be combined into one single Schnorr signature. So in terms of the amount of space the signatures would take up, they would be pretty much the same. So in this latter example, where you've got these three inputs that send a transaction, 
it's much, much cheaper to store that signature than it is, you know, having three or more in a, in a multi-sig transaction. Now, another big benefit of this increased efficiency from a Schnorr signature is the reduction in the effect of spam transactions. So if we go back to the diagrams, actually, you can see that if I wanted to spam the Bitcoin network, let's go back up to the way it works today. If I wanted to spam the Bitcoin network, I could intentionally send dozens of transactions, right? I could just send dozens of transactions, that's fine. But I could also make sure that each one of those transactions involved dozens or even hundreds of different addresses, each one requiring a signature as pointed out in this diagram. So the size of that transaction overall would be pretty large, right? The size of those transactions would mean that the amount of block space that they would take up would be large. The blocks would get full, but without requiring a large number of transactions, right? Because each of my transactions are fatter in their own right. Now, with Schnorr signatures, if we go back to that diagram, then with this, it, um, it greatly levels the playing field. Since those spam transactions, right, that have lots and lots of inputs, they would be on a level playing field with legitimate transactions, each of them having to pay only for one signature, right, or as much space as one signature takes up. So as Sam points out in this blog post, the signature is often the part of the transaction that takes up the most space in the block. And Schnorr signatures don't prevent spam, but they would make the um, effect of spam transactions less disruptive on other users because the spam transactions are now sort of compressed and uh, all of those additional signatures don't aren't required and aren't taking up block space and therefore wouldn't be elbowing out legitimate users from blocks. Now, while this all sounds very exciting, the major thing holding it back is the adoption, the actual adoption of SegWit. Yes, SegWit is activated, but there are still a number of different organizations, wallets and so on in the space that are not using it. And we can see this by going to segwit.party. This is a site you might have seen me show before. I'll go on the left hand side of the screen so you can see the graph here. Now, SegWit was a backwards compatible soft fork, meaning Bitcoin can flow in and out of SegWit and non-SegWit addresses freely. It doesn't mean once you've got it in a SegWit address, it's stuck there. It's completely forwards and backwards compatible, which is how come this graph changes from, from time to time. Right now, as we see on SegWit Party, still only around 10% of all Bitcoin transactions are using SegWit addresses and the rest of them are still using the old regular Bitcoin address format. And they're obviously bigger and taking more space in a block. But we look a few days ago and we see it was right up here at 15%. So since then, there was 15% there was of all the Bitcoin went into SegWit addresses. And since then, some of it's come out again. So we're, we're kind of going forwards and backwards in adoption of SegWit. But that's good because that's the benefit of a soft fork. It doesn't require everyone to switch overnight and then it uh, doesn't create a bunch of outcasts if people do not upgrade on the day that they are supposed to. So the adoption of SegWit, this all really comes down to the services that have high volumes of transactions and lots of Bitcoin coming in and out, such as exchanges is a big one, and even the wallet developers themselves, right? Many of them are not generating SegWit addresses by default. And the average user is none the wiser, right? They don't care. They don't, they don't care about what the wallet does. They don't want to have to switch a switch to say, I want to use SegWit or don't, right? We need to hide all of that complexity from them. They just want to click like deposit Bitcoin to my exchange or generate me a receiving address from my uh, Exodus wallet or whatever it is. And then um, whatever the wallet does is they're taking care of that for the user. And right now, the vast majority of them are generating old style Bitcoin addresses. So it's up to the developers and the exchanges to implement SegWit so that the next time they use this generate a deposit address, it displays a SegWit address, right? And that would cause the graph we just saw on SegWit Party to start climbing significantly. So until more wallets and exchanges and all the various other services start actually making use of these SegWit addresses, then all of these wonderful technologies that depend on SegWit will just have to be waiting on the shelf. 
All right, guys, thanks very much for joining me today. If you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you're new around here, get subscribed. And if you would like access to my very best material, such as my structured online courses that will teach you things like how to make and save money with Bitcoin, check out CryptoVestD.com. Click on the I in the top right corner. It will take you right through there. So that's all for today. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the CryptoVest. And so until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.